Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. This week, NEA Jazz Master Jim Hall and jazz guitar virtuoso will be performing selections with his brand new ensemble featuring guitarist Julian Lange, who I have profiled here on the Pace Report a couple of years ago. Tonight, he's got a lot to celebrate. One, he just turned 80 in November, and also he's got two dynamic projects that are getting ready to come out on the Artist Share label. One, a very rare live performance, volume two through four, live at the Bourbon Street Club in Toronto, Canada from 1976, as well as a brand new quartet live album recorded at Birdland. I sat down with Mr. Hall and talked about his career, we talked about these brand new recordings, and we also talked about what keeps him going at 80 years old. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. Jim Hall live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. Congratulations on this brand new ensemble, Julian Lange on guitar, yeah. Joey Barron and Scott Colley on bass. This is a very interesting amalgamation because you have two guitarists. Yeah, yeah it, uh, I first, Scott and I met Julian when he was 11 years old out in Berkeley, California. We worked in a club out there and Julian came in with his parents and he came in a dressing room and played my guitar great. So, so I've known about him for a while. And, uh, and then he's been working with Gary Burton uh, quite a bit. And now Julian is teaching up at Berkeley in Boston, too. So, and I'd heard a couple of really unusual forward-looking records that Julian had made recently. And I thought, why not? Let me try this. It might be... Because I, I like to try to keep things fresh and moving forward all the time. And uh, it just worked out great. He's a lovely guy, and he plays fantastic. And Scott and Joey, of course, they're pretty good, too. <laughs> so <laughs> worked out great. You've been playing with Joey and Scott off and on for over 30 years. In fact, you and 
and Joey have a duo record also on the Artist Share label. That's right. <clears throat> yeah, it's called uh, Conversations. And uh, that's funny. I had to, I went through this back surgery. It's been almost three years now, I guess. Uh, and I hadn't really played at all, and I was trying to get playing again. And I think it was Joey's idea just to do a, a duet thing. We, we had done a quartet thing with... Uh, Bill Frizzell, that, that Bill, Bill and I did a duet, and then we, in the second, it's a two record uh, release, anyway, and the other part is with Scott and Joey. Um, but Joey was so inventive on the record date, he, he would come up with new sounds, and he had uh, all kinds of uh, uh, symbols and things that he brought in, and he just kept making it uh, fun and interesting, and I think it worked out great. So. I, it it takes me a while to forgive myself for records, so I hadn't listened to it in quite a while. And about a month ago, late at night, I put on the headphones and I listened to it, and I actually liked it all the way through. So that was fun. It's also a big celebration for you also because Volumes 3 and 4, live at Bourbon Street in Toronto, Canada, from 1976, are about to be released also. Yeah, yeah. That's, I haven't even heard the extra stuff. Uh, uh, that that was fun too. That, that was with Terry Clark and uh, and Don Thompson played bass. And Don actually recorded it. He had his equipment up on the stage, and we sort of forgot we were recording. So we were having fun and losing meter and laughing a lot. So uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what that sounds like. And uh, yeah, Brian Camillo's going to put that out on Artist Share. I don't. I'm not positive if it's released yet or not, but. That's a, uh, um, you get that, what, off the internet, is that? <laughs> yeah, right, artist here. I don't even have a computer. I'm still in the kerosene age, but, yeah, that should be fun to hear, I think. the first time that you guys played together and were you shocked by him asking to play your song tonight? I was very touched that he would want to play it. Uh, we got together about, I'd 
say two months ago, and, and I brought some songs, he brought some songs, and I just, you know, I'm so unbelievably thrilled to play with him and play in this project that, uh, yeah, the fact that he's doing my tune is great, and it would be great if he didn't, too. I'm just, I'm thrilled. What is it about Mr. Hall that has made jazz guitar in the world of jazz something that many, many jazz guitarists look up to? Wow, well, I, you know, I think, for, I can speak personally that Jim is my number one hero, you know, and what makes him so is that he's not only a master of the instrument, but he's such an improvisational force, you know, for, to me, he stands for everything that's exciting and fresh, um, just about, you know, within the arts, within the creative circle, you know, um, and he's consistently throughout his career been unique and fresh and inspiring and always so nuanced and never over the top but just passionate I mean I, to me he's the most consummate musician and he happens to play guitar which is lucky for us guitar players what's it like playing with Mr. Hall man it's it's such a trip I mean I'm, I look over and see him playing it's he plays the baddest stuff I've ever heard <laughs> it's like guitar playing from the future and yet it's happening right now you know it's it's I'm just along for the ride and loving it every bit of it tell me about growing up in Cleveland you really had an epiphany or there was a musician that kind of opened up your eyes and you decided that you really wanted to follow and play the guitar well the uh, I, I had I had an Uncle Ed who, who played guitar, kind of hillbilly guitar. as my mom's brother. Uh, and that was kind of what I heard <laughs> growing up, was just kind of Baptist church music and hillbilly music. But my mom got me a, a guitar. I was 9 or 10, and I started taking lessons. And by the time I was 13, I was playing in little groups. Uh, we usually accordion, drums, and clarinet, and never a bass, you know. We played polkas and things. And... The clarinet player went to a record store to get a Benny Goodman record, and I heard uh, we played some of it at the store. And I heard uh, Grand Slam, the Charlie. It's a blues and F. And Charlie Christian played uh, two choruses, and it, I that was kind of my spiritual awakening. I said, well, whatever that is, I wish I could do it, and uh, so that that really turned me around. And uh, I never got to meet him because he died when he was in his early 20s, I think, it was really kind of tragic, but I, he was some kind of genius, because I've, everything I've ever heard of him and about him is remarkable. Uh, and then as, as I got, <laughs> you know, older, I just somehow decided I wanted to go to college, and I wanted to be a better musician, so I, they had this great school in Cleveland, the Institute of Music, but there was no guitar and no jazz, so it took me about six months to get my piano playing together so I could get into school. And that was great. I was there five years and started doing a, I heard incredible music, modern music and uh, Mozart and everything else and Gregorian chant. Uh, and then uh, I took off after five years. We, we drove out to Los Angeles and hooked up with Chico Hamilton. So it's been really, really good time for me, everything. You took a lot of the classical influences and kind of made your own style as far as a jazz guitarist. What was it about some of the classical components that has enhanced your guitar style over the years and even up to now? Well, what came to mind when you said that was, I guess, develop, taking an idea and developing it as you would if, if you were a composer. Like uh, Beethoven, da, 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 da. he could have said, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to skip that. Um, I think probably the uh, the idea of uh, of turning an improvised piece into a composition and having uh, having it sound like a composition rather rather than just bebop lines that you've practiced and uh, and also the idea of listening to what's going on around you the bass player and the drummer or that other fantastic guitar player I worked with the blue note um yeah i think i think that was very important also it it uh i heard so much music of all different sorts as i said 
besides Mozart, and they had Gregorian chant and and Bartok and uh, Arnold Schoenberg. My composition teacher had uh, it was one of a Jewish man that had to leave uh, Vienna because of the Nazis, and but he had been around Arnold Schoenberg and those people. So, you know, I went from hillbilly music to <laughs> to 20th century music. 12-tone music and everything. It, it was great, great experience. piggyback on something I asked sure. you earlier in regards to your duos. Um, just recently, I just interviewed the legendary Ron Carter for his 75th birthday, and yeah. I happened to include the performance between you and Mr. Carter, and you happen to really like playing in a duo setting. I do, uh, especially, well, I guess any duo. I was thinking of drums and guitar, but Ron and I did duets quite a bit and, and we got so tuned into one another that uh, for instance I would just automatically realize I wouldn't have to play the low notes in a chord because Ron had that covered and uh, I would listen to his bass lines and where he was going and I would make my chords if I was playing chords or solo or anything fit that and there's there's places on a couple of our duo records where we both start kind of chuckling <laughs> and because we know you know, Ron will play something kind of off, uh, you know, offbeat, and I'll catch it, and then he'll, <laughs> and then he'll grin, you know. So yeah, it was, uh, I've known Ron for a long, long time, um, and we worked together in a lot of different situations over the years, and uh, the uh, uh, the. The racial thing in the states has has improved remarkably since when we started working. It used to get kind of uncomfortable down south of the border and everything. And Ron and I went through a lot of that together, and so so we share a, a, a long history. And so when we get together to play, it's just like old times. You know, it's lovely. <laughs>
Jim Hall signature sound. Well, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, re I really don't know. I just uh, probably like it to sound like Ben Webster or something. <laughs> something more like a... Uh, a little bit more like a wind instrument, I guess, when I'm playing uh, solos, anyhow, and maybe uh, the shape of it may be more compositional than uh, than bebop licks that I've learned. So uh, I, I think I probably try to sound like a wind instrument when I play. I think that's part of it. Having been around, uh, you know, Sonny Rollins, Ben Webster, and Paul Desmond, and all those people, so. Uh, Almost got to work with Benny Goodman, but we didn't get along too well. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. So, I guess I I think of it more as a as a legato, almost a wind instrument when I play. I think. Jim, you've had the wonderful opportunity, and still have the wonderful yeah. opportunity to have recorded with some of the greatest minds of music. And I'm just going to ask a couple of. I'm going to give a couple of names of just what your take on these artists. Bill Evans. Yeah, Bill was you know, fantastic, sensitive, uh, gifted piano player. And I had known Bill for a while. Uh, uh, John Lewis had this school of jazz at the end of every summer up at Lenox, Massachusetts. And Bill... Bill and I were both teaching up there one time, and then Bill was with Miles Davis. We worked, uh, Jim Jufrey and Bob Brookmeyer and I worked opposite Miles' band with uh, Philly Joe Jones, uh, Paul Chambers, uh, Can Cannonball Adderley, and John Coltrane, and Bill was the piano player. So I got to hear Bill a lot with, uh, with that group. And then when I was working with Sonny Rollins, Bill just came in a club one night and said, you want to make a duet album? So I said, why not? And I think we did rehearse at his house a little bit, but mostly it was just uh, listening and reacting. Uh, and Bill was so tuned into what was going on with texture, for instance. He liked me to play rhythm guitar behind him. And But as soon as I would, he would automatically not use his left hand because he figured that part of the texture was covered. So, so that that worked out really well with Bill. Um, Paul Desmond. Yeah, Paul. W Paul used to come over to to the apartment a lot, and he and Janie would play Scrabble together or something. And he, um, I can't remember where I first met Paul. Oh, he when he was with, with Dave Brubeck, but. Uh, it was kind of similar. I, I think we rehearsed a bit, uh, but he just such a lovely guy and played so melodically. It was, it was as, as I say, I always feel so privileged that the people I've bunked into and recorded with and everything. And um, yeah, he was uh, he he was just a great great man and a. This, again, extremely bright guy. I guess you have to be to play that good, so that was fun. Pat Metheny. Yeah, Pat, I met when he was a kid. I think he was 15. And I was playing with Ron Carter at a club called The Guitar up in the, I don't know, 50s or something here. And uh, Pat came in with Attila Zoller, uh, another marvelous guitar player uh, who died not too long ago. And uh, until I had a, I don't know, music school or something, and so that's where I met Pat. And uh, uh, gradually we just got to know one another, and then we did a we did a duet album together and everything. And uh, I think we have some more stuff coming up someplace. I don't know, but again, it's it's just been fun interacting with it. It's sort of like having conversations. That's what it is. <laughs>
at 81 years young. What keeps you going, Mr. Hall? Well, the rent <laughs> is one. Uh, well, the cute thing to say was it's the only thing I know how to do, but... Uh, yeah, every once in a while I think, man, 81, how did... The Sonny Rollins has got a few months on me, too, and Sonny uh, is incredible. He's, uh, parenthetically, Sonny got that award at the Kennedy Center last December, and that was so touching to me to, to be involved in that. Uh, Christian McBride put together a bunch of us to, to play for it, and uh, just I felt so great about the way things are different in our country now, and uh, I won't go into all the detail, but just that, uh, you know, Sonny got a, a Kennedy Center Award. That was so marvelous with the, uh, the uh, who's the uh, the cellist that, was Yo-Yo Ma, is that his name? Yeah, and uh, Meryl Streep got, um, so I guess uh, it, it feels like a universal language, and it, it cuts, music does, and it cuts through everything. And uh, I liked it, if, if I could ever learn to get so I could play like Sonny Rollins, <laughs> or Charlie Parker for that matter, I, I would really love that. So, In the 60s, it was Wes Montgomery and you that were pretty much the dominant force of jazz guitar and looking at it now in 2012 you're still around and you're still influencing and giving the world your gift what is it that you think that your fans really enjoy seeing you over and over again now versus 30 40 50 years ago yeah well i, I hope that i've continued to grow uh, i really loved wes a lot we uh, we got to hang, we hung out together in San Francisco one time. We were going around the club, and I was threatening to catch his thumb in a taxi door a few times, <laughs> put him out of business. Uh, but uh, well, I guess I could say it's the only thing I don't know how to do, so I keep doing it. That's. But the other thing is, I never feel like it's over. The, as I said. The guitar sits there and says, "Yeah, try and tune me today, <laughs> dummy." So it's a, it's kind of a growth experience constantly. Um, occasionally, it's a gross experience as well, but it uh, it just sort of keeps me going forward, and that seems to be the best idea. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Blue Note here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. Jim Hall for his time and his hospitality, as well as the staff and management here at the Blue Note. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.